came up and uh, speak to our, our team. of the health 
of Nevada's public lands, uh, certainly uh, critical to me as I serve on uh, the National Association of Counties uh, Agriculture and Rural Communities uh, uh, Steering Committee. Uh, specific areas of interest include the uh, expansion, expanding the scope of statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan, coordinate outdoor recreation infrastructure planning, and implementation with small business development in rural counties. Uh, so with that being said, uh, and my wife always cautions me, uh, every time I go out and speak, uh, I ask her afterwards, uh, how did I do? And she says, well, you did well, except you missed several great opportunities to sit down and shut up. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, I won't continue much longer, but uh, in closing, let me say that we definitely understand here in Douglas County the economic benefits your organization and the off-highway vehicle uh, community bring to our county, and we appreciate your, once again, your uh, attendance here today, and I'm sure you'll hear more about the direct economic benefits that your organization and others like you provide to Douglas County as you hear from our business authority, like the lead campaign or needs to be here later on today. Or so Jim, Jim's going to be in and out. I said okay. that if it's so, dead. And, and, and of course, Ms. Deborah also. So, anyways, thank you once again for the opportunity to say a few words, uh, Matt, and, uh, and awesome. thank you for bringing us to the uh, Thank you. Deborah. And then we're going to speak briefly about uh, all things tourism and why you should come to Douglas County, spend your money, then go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get it. Leave your wallets at the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get it. Hello, I'm here on behalf of the Carson Valley Visitors Authority. Our executive oh, director is in Genoa doing tours right now for uh, tourism types people and so he will be in and out and he did ask for me to stop by and say first of all welcome welcome to all of you whether you be local state agencies or guests from out of area welcome to our community we want to thank Matthew and all of the other organizations that made this summit possible and most of all we want to thank you individually for deciding to come because that was a choice. It's kind of like when you fly, they say you have a choice when you fly. Well, you had a choice if you wanted to be here today. And time is everything, so thank you for that. Uh, as many of you know, if not all of you, Carson Valley is a wealth of outdoor recreation opportunities. If you step outside of the Carson Valley Inn and do a 360, there is no way that you look that does not offer some sort of recreational opportunity. And the most recent one, and one that we're very proud of here in Douglas County, is literally at the end of this parking lot. It's called the Martin Slew Trail. It took us about 16 years to make it happen, and so many organizations, probably many of you in this room, uh, that it's uh, phenomenal. But what it is, is it's a 10-foot wide paved multimodal path, literally at the end of this parking lot, that connects the town of Minden and the town of Gardnerville. It's, uh, it's for non-motorized, although many an e-bike, I've seen many an e-bike, and that's another whole subject on that trail. It's 2.3 miles, and if you have a chance, go out and take a look at it, because it's going to show you something about our community that you don't see driving down 395. You're going to see agriculture, you're going to see wildlife, you're going to see uh, things that we are, that we're all about, and we welcome you to take a minute out there on that trail. In addition to that, and for those of you that are from out of area only. We have hiking, we have biking, we have a map that hopefully you're going to pick up. up. I, I saw it out there on the, um, the table. And it's going to show you all the trailheads. And, and it's going to show you where you can fish and where you can uh, boat. And on and on and on. This is created by the Visitors Authority, and it's another thing that we're very proud of. And a lot of other uh, communities have taken a look at what we do here and realized how important it is to promote the whole top of this is dining, the bottom is shopping, and then this side is the map for those of you that are going to take advantage of our outdoor recreational opportunities. Let's see, again, as Mark said, we do understand the impact that off-road vehicles and everything about it do for our community. 
uh, bringing it down to the local level, I'll give you an example of how we gave back and showing our appreciation. Um, Kingsbury Grade, which is the road that goes in between here and Lake Tahoe, North Benjamin, which is a right-hand turn off the Kingsbury Grade, is going to take you to a trailhead. It is one of the most spectacular OHP trails in this area. It's going to take you up into the Alpine Forest, and then you're going to have views of the lake extraordinaire. Not very many states in the United States, as a matter of fact, none, have an Alpine lake equivalent to Lake Tahoe. And so we're very proud of that. We put a million dollars, and I'm not going to say we put every penny of it, but our Parks and Rec Department personally put $400,000 into making that trailhead accessible, as well as having restrooms so that you're not out there in the wilderness but nowhere to do what you need to do, as well as parking for your trailers. So if you have a chance, if it's not part of this tour, but if you have a chance, go out and take a look at it because it is a spectacular trail. Uh, let's see here. And now back to you and, and back to what you offer to the whole of OHD in the United States. And that is your willingness to watch out and help us to maintain the access to public lands that we currently have and that we need to have. So we need to be a united voice and it's people like you in this room that are that united voice. And we thank you for your enthusiasm and your help in that. In addition to that, we uh, have run into, on numerous occasions, persons that don't really see the OH beer than anything more than a, a terror that's going out into the wilderness and terrorizing. And that's not what we're about. So you're the stewards and the educators to help get that word out. Who are we? We have very expensive equipment. We a lot of times have the trailers and, and the campers that go with it are far more than you're going to pay for a home in some places. <laughs> we do not go out there and tear through and chase the horses and you know all the other safe grounds and all the other things. And more importantly, we bring back what we take out. And you have to be the stewards and the educators of that. So please take a moment to talk to a neighbor and say, this is what we're about, so that we're, we're not the bad guys. OHB is not the bad guys. We welcome you. We understand your value. We want you to come back. If you have any questions of me or anybody else, I have one more thing. This is our visitor's guide. And within our visitor's guide, again, it's out there on the table. Within our visitor's guide is a lot of the trails as well as all the restaurants that we want you to frequent and other activities for you to do. Thank you for choosing us and have a nice time.
Yes. 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 partner 
These are the people that you need to work with. I can't go to BLM and get in their face and say, you get when the, uh, the Carson officers still are up if I had that relationship with them. What I can do is I can go to the, that office and say, hey, this is really screwy. How do we fix this? How do we get to the finish line and be successful? And that's what we're here about today. There's those partnerships. Everyone in this room has 26 hours of flight time in multi-engine aircraft as of today. By the time we're out here at the end of the week, everybody will be flying right to you. That's the goal. All right. Anybody have any questions for, uh, for me before we get going? I had an agenda up here today. Everybody else had one. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we are up to McKeel with the Nevada Off-Highway Vehicle Program. Uh, you're going to speak a little bit about uh, the funding that's available, funding that we want to get on the ground uh, in your home dirt. Uh, that's the most important part. Thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks all. Okay, hey everyone, uh, Nikhil Narkade, I'm with the Nevada Off-Highway Vehicles Program. Um, the program, staff of one, administers all of the grants that our nine-member OHP commission um, gets to award. So every December, up until recently, it was every December. Um, now it's going to be every December and every summer that we all get into one room and we judge how to spend this um, OHB money that's been generated by the $20 registration sticker. So we have this, um, it's kind of a privilege that we have 82, 82% of land in Nevada's public and it's open for our access, so we want to preserve that. Um, following a lot of other states, we've implemented a fee to use that privilege to operate your OHB, your motorized vehicle on public land. And now, unlike some other states, we have established a nine-member commission, and they get to decide where this money is spent. Five of those members, four of, four of those members until recently were up here. I'd suggest during the next three days that if you don't have experience meeting those OHV commissioners, that you um, kind of work with them, get make a face-to-face -face contact, and share with them how you foresee OHV recreation around the state. Um, that way, they can be your voice as they talk to their um, county commissions or the entities that they have been appointed to represent. So I mentioned that there's nine members. That means that they represent nine different entities. All of this is detailed in NRS 490. So I'm not going to go over um, who the different representation is on the OHB commission. I will let you know that they have the only authority to spend the funds that are collected when you register your OHB. Can't go be spent to any other um, state funding opportunity unless it goes through those nine members. Similarly, there's very little um, state overhead on this project. We want to see this money go back out into the communities and see what you guys want to see as want to like realize as improvements in your community. I can't tell you, I can't tell you what the best way to build an OHB trail. I can probably show you where my favorite OHB trail is. So that's why we're looking to the clubs to have this engagement with our OHB commissioners. In 2018, 2019, I assumed this administrative position and we, um, we kind of struggled to host this OHB summit, a venue where we could attract um, like, not only like-minded people, but everybody that's out recreating in the state and show them that, hey, we are taking these specific steps through a five-year plan. We're taking specific steps through our funding grantees from education and safety to kind of improve the outlook of OHB recreation in the state, but then also to a attract others that are coming, you know, from, from over our state borders or even worldwide. If you come in here, what's one good experience that you can take home to India from Nevada? I'd be psyched if I could go home and tell, tell my, like, ran around the state in this little side-by-side -side that goes 50 miles an hour over dirt. They'd be excited because they're all riding, like, 50cc mopeds on the street, right? So the, the engagement here is not only to build up what's in our backyard, 
but to also spread that information, well, I'd, I'd say nationwide, but let's go worldwide. Okay, um, so a little bit of how the grades can be used for. There are 10 categories, it's all listed on our OHB website, but after today's meeting, we do want to see investments in safety training, education, um, and building like purpose-built trails. So while the route is open for OHB recreation, that's awesome, but is that route actually really fun to ride or is it just a method of getting from A to B? We want to see more developed recreation that's really like purpose-built for, for riding trails. Um, it goes the same way in like a lot of the, the mountain biking community, uh, the road biking community, I'm sure they'll each tell you that, oh, this road is exemplary to ride, or this trail is exemplary to ride. We want those opportunities for, for our off-road community. All right, uh, I'll leave you with a few short items here. Commission meetings, these guys have me uh, scheduling public meetings every other month. So if there's a topic that was missed, then make sure that you send me an email, make sure you reach out to your OHB commissioner, and have them put it on the agenda for uh, the next for the next meeting. We have the eight members right now are very engaged. They serve three-year terms, and so they'll be around here, and they, they represent your voice in the road record. Finally, we've been having these OHV summits since 2008. Since 2018 and 19, we took a hiatus for one reason or another. They didn't let us do it in 20 or 21, and now we're back under uh, with Matthew's leadership for 2022. Um, a lot of these summits occur in like rural, not, I don't want to say rural Nevada, but um, portions of Nevada that have great access to public lands and very little road traffic. Um, so if you have a spot like that in mind, I'd reach out to Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's everything for me, but I do want to extend a thank you to Nevada Off-Road Association and, um, and just like, draw attention to the support that they have brought to the table since I think it was the beginning of 2022. I've known Matthew for a few years now, but I stumbled through last year and this year he's put together a, um, an agency that can help support our voice um, kind of statewide. And while we do that, I hope that Matthew continues to call me to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to OHB recreation. All right, thank you. How much um, the state normally collects a year? Yeah, good idea. So um, there are 50,000 active OHB registrations in the state. Annual revenue is around 1.2 million, and then we award one and a half million dollars each year towards OHB projects. Anybody else have any questions for me too? Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, I've known Kiel for a while. I watched him uh, like an old man. <laughs> I watched him get on like his first group like ever in the band. <laughs> I wish I had a video. So next up, we're going to uh, be talking about the uh, Nevada is it Division of Mines. Division of Minerals. Division of Minerals, which is what you find in your mind. I'm not sure what we're doing. But there's Chaos Day Life program. The, there is a, a, an issue that we're dealing with right now in, in the Murray Drop Road community um, about that danger. I, I don't know how many people follow it, obviously, closely as we do. Um, over the weekend, we had two fatalities down off the Gene, my, the Gene Dry Lake bed on the rail. Uh, some users, uh, for reasons which I'm not going to get into, uh, ended up on the train tracks and found out that a little bit of a more than a racer. A uh, person who claims killed both the people. And was a big doom. Uh, had a, a, a calf sled or a tip over rather, uh, crushing the arm of a child. Kid lost an arm. This is just last weekend. And there was also uh, Mr. Amar. Is it a single or a double big alley that we had up at uh, uh, out of this one? So they had a big alley, also a roll, roll over no helmet with seatbelts, as reported, uh, or as I heard, of the same amount. Those are our problems. That's our users. Where I think that we uh, work out really well with the Nevada Division of Minerals and the Stay Out, Stay Alive is that there are a lot of people who enjoy going out to ride to some of these historic sites. And it's kind of cool. Um, 
I'm not going to fall down on my shaft. You know why? Because I'm a coward. I'm not getting that close to the edge. <laughs> so why don't you go and come on up, uh, turn on your microphone, you can speak to what you got going on, and we'll go from there. PowerPoint, yeah. Uh, Kim, is PowerPoint lit and ready to go? Uh, have we got it on a flash drive? Yeah. 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 So while they're doing that real quick, uh, like I said, there was uh, some cards in your new folders. Uh, so we got five cards for questions. Um, as you fill those out uh, during the break, um, there's a helmet uh, from Axel Offer Helmets. Which are really cool homes, by the way. Uh, if I can just drop in there, we collect them under the room and get them over to the uh, landing managers either uh, tomorrow or next day. All right, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Sean Derby. I'm the uh, program manager for the Fan and Mind List program for the state. Uh, the division that owns is a small agency. There's about 15 of us, and we're an independent division, so we're not part of any other department. Uh, we have direct oversight from the governor's office. So, that means we can get a lot done when we have strong partnerships. Um, now we're talking about the importance of partnerships, we have good relationships uh, with BLM, the Forest Service, and our other partner state agencies so that we can get these important jobs done and push through. Uh, one of the things while we get ready that I want to tell you about is that uh, we've just received approval from the governor's office to do direct funding with the counties and we're looking at work with nonprofits to do hard closure programs. That means if we find a site that's extremely dangerous, that's being a lot of visitation, or there's been a fatality act, uh, we can work directly with groups to fund them to get these, these closures uh, complete. Uh, so if our commissioner, our gardener, is still here. Uh, he took off. He took off. Uh, but yeah, this is, a, I mean, this week type thing. So uh, we're really happy about that. We're going to reach out to the counties to start with this pilot program to see how this is going to work. But uh, I'm not sure, Matthew, have we ever talked with you guys before? Uh, no, I ran into one of your associates at the uh, Elko Planner meeting oh, a month or two back. Okay. Um, so I'll just kind of fill you in on what we do. Uh, if our other partner agencies thank you, uh, that are out there see any ability to work together, I see parks here. Uh, just, uh, you know, come chat with me after. Anybody else, i got some swag back there. Uh, we always like to see the bumper stickers stay off sale out on the back of UTD. I can't tell you how many times we go out, we're all over the state, and I think I'm in the middle of nowhere, and I hear a little hum coming up. I see a whole family pop out and want to check out these historical features. So, all right, I'm just going to walk through this, and I won't take tell you time. I do have a video, though, uh, of group of Marines going down uh, a, a mine shaft. And it's got a, uh, not very comfortable ending, but everybody came out okay. Uh, we're not going to ruin it, but we'll get to it. So the Division Minerals, uh, we have a legislative mandate to encourage and assist uh, the responsible exploration uh, for and in the production of minerals, oil, gas, and geothermal uh, to the state. The that is core. Uh, apart from gaming, in terms of tax revenue, it comes from mining. Uh, it's how our state started. Uh, so we have a unique position where having this history with business and industry and being spun off on our own, uh, we're actually out there to promote mining and exploration. We want to see that grow. Uh, I guess what that means for you guys is, is that we have all these legacy mines out there that have been part of this history that are are interesting stops, interesting areas to go visit, prospect, if you want to do that, we encourage that too. So uh, we'll just go right to what I'm concerned about, what I run is the abandoned mine lands program. We have a number of things that we do. We want to educate uh, Nevadans, young Nevadans, about what mining does for the state, what its history has been. So we're not scaring people. We're trying to actually move the facts about you know, what it does for us and how it's part of our culture. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, outreach. Uh, there at the bottom, I want uh, anybody who's interested in prospecting or even looking at maps that are related to the history of mining, check out the open data site. It, it shows you where active claims are. It shows you where good historical activity occurred. 
what kind of commodities were being pulled out of the ground, uh, even gives you production numbers on historical gold mining all over the state. Uh, and it's something that, is there any PLM here? Okay. I love the PLM. You guys do great work. We're great to partner with you. Uh, this is an add-on for anybody who's ever used LR2000. Anybody knows what that is knows that it's kind of complicated. It's a ton of data. This helps parse that process down. So if you're interested in LR2000, check that out. I'll show you a real life, uh, you know, real time image of where things are. So the abandoned mine lands program uh, was started in the late 80s uh, after we were seeing an uptick of uh, fatalities uh, in, in mine features. Now, if anybody's familiar with Virginia City, they probably know about American Flats. It's an area where you know high school kids used to go, and a lot of legacy mining, uh, a lot of extremely dangerous stuff. Uh, you could walk into an old mill site, and you got a, a hole that's a thousand feet deep with nothing around it. Uh, so this is an area where we started seeing a lot more uh, fatalities and the legislature took action and made this part of our legislative mandate. But that came with a couple of complications, which are how do you get inventory a state as big as Nevada uh, for these bad environments? I mean, we, we think there are 50,000 plus of these things. Every time I go up to a site, a historical mining industry, if I had three more abandoned mine sites than I was looking for that were even on my map. So they wanted us, uh, the legislature wanted us to do inventory. They wanted us to secure the sites. Okay, so 20, we're up to 25,000 sites, I think, as of yesterday. So that means if that is a barricade, if it's really dangerous, steel bar, you guys have probably seen those. Uh, and we're working with uh, BLM, Forest Service, uh, a lot of different partner agencies to get the funding to make all that happen. But we're only 13 people, and really only three to do an A&O work. We work with a lot of contractors, so thanks to BLM for all that uh, funding that we get for that. And then public awareness, I mean, that's why I'm here today, but a lot of it goes into these new schools, making sure you know kids in elementary school just see this and know early on that this is a danger. You know, this isn't kind of something fun to check out. I mean, we're probably more than happy to bend out around these things and gone in. I mean, I gotta confess, when I was in the mining uh, industry and in exploration, I went to quite a few of these uh, for my job, but uh, never really brought home any hot data to work. So I started working with people. So this is a picture of all of the historical mining districts that are in the state. Now, these have been developed over the last uh, 150 years. Uh, the Bureau of Mines and Geology basically uh, Regal has uh, done work on a lot of these to determine what their viability is. And all of these areas have uh, deadly dangerous mine shafts. Uh, and you can see the density of it. It's just, it's almost like the old timers just linked hands and just walked across the state. So, uh, like I said, we estimate based on you know, how often we're finding these things. Uh, and now we're, we're, able, we're able to incorporate uh, LIDAR technology so that it's identifying uh, where the potential sites could be. So we use that to target. But we figured it was about 50,000, so I got about uh, another 35 years left, so I should get to the time and <laughs> be able to close this all up. Uh, as I don't know if this percentage has changed, I just heard that it was 83. If you don't include all the withdrawals that have occurred, uh, over the years, we're probably still back up there 87, but we do have that. Uh, you know, it's very fortuitous for us, uh, it, but yeah, like everything comes with strings. Um, again, we could do this without the cooperation of BLM, Forest Service, Park Service, BOR, uh, and definitely end down in PD. End down completes all of our uh, wildlife surveys. Because, as many of you know, if you're on federal land, you have to go through the NEPA process if you want to put a shovel in the ground. So uh, we have these good partnerships, and uh, we get all that the cultural surveys, the wildlife surveys, a lot of that legwork. Uh, we get the help from from our partner agencies. So this is what um, I kind of came to show you guys. Uh, again, probably a lot of you have been out and seen these things as you've been driving around. Uh, I believe this is White. No, we got Lonnie County down there on the left. Uh, and we got white pine up here on the right. Uh, you know, you 
might get on here a mind track or an ad and say, it comes to pretty cool, let's check this out. But the real danger is, like I found out in White Pine County this summer, uh, we're doing some carries, we're walking along, you know, out there is now war, I don't know if maybe it's been a war mountain, you can it. But the ground in there is like Swiss cheese. And we're out there banging, you know, our best posts or drivers put them in the fence. And you can hear uh, settling going on. And we looked around about an hour later and a sinkhole had formed about 40 feet away from where we were, big enough to swallow a truck. Uh, and, you know, we documented security, but it just brought home to me it's not just that you're in danger if you go in. It's when you're in these areas, you know, you're reaping the shear. We had a truck, the sheriff's department called, so it's before the incident. And a Ford Raptor had gone head first about uh, 20 feet down the mine shaft. And uh, they had a record come up, pull it out, and then they just, the county just backed from there, which you're not supposed to do. But in that, that case, it's okay. Uh, but, you know, so the issues are, are many. These things can take many different shapes. But if you see cultural features like uh, down here on the right, you've got an old head frame there. You can see that there's some outbuilding. You know you're in a mining area. That's when you want to start to take care and look around for signs of subsidence in the roadways. Uh, and obviously, you know, you're, you're going to want to avoid going into these things if you if you're curious so you can be uh, withheld. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go into this too much, but every year part of the part of our legislative mandate is to notify people. Uh, out there that have land uh, that contain dangerous mines uh, to talk to the counties if they're under the ownership. Basically, we want to inform anybody out there with liability uh, that this is going on in their property and that we'd love it if they'd secure it. We don't have an enforcement arm, um, but we work with the counties to, to really get the bad ones taken care of. Um, so if you've gotten a love letter from the division, I'm sorry. Uh, but the simple fact is, is that we just need as much help as possible uh, in getting these carriers made to keep, you know, the bad and safe. So this is part of our summer internship program. We hired eight students from UNR, UNLV, some of the smaller uh, schools around uh, the area, and we go out. And basically, this is a twofold thing. Uh, I actually did the math. It's not really a cost savings. Am I going over that? How am I doing the time? No, you're fine. Okay. Um, we want these kids to learn how to read a map, A. Uh, B, we want to teach them how to drive off road. So we, we spend a whole uh, two weeks now teaching them all the kind of skills they're going to need. You know, how to change a tire when you're on, on the ground. How to get yourself out of trouble uh, in any of the situations they end up, they end up in life. But yeah, not a cost savings uh, to get in the summer. It turns out the contractors are cheaper. Uh, but we do end up at the end of the summer with a lot more competent uh, kids that can go back to school and hopefully share some of this stuff. But we're trying to train these guys and have them be out in the world of that and kind of looking up what that lifestyle could look like. But also building those skills, working as a team, doing some hard labor out in the world of that in the summer. So this is our classic photograph that you see. We've got a database full of these things in the inventory. We've got a map of the battle covered in red. Every time you click on a point, you see one of these pictures. Sometimes these guys drop their, their uh, drawers and you know, get 14 weeks and you see a photograph of a guy with pants on. So that's for the students. Um, so this is the data. I'm not going to show you the database so well, but here's a, we can be proud of Douglas County. Uh, here because you can see uh, they have one of the lowest numbers of uh, maybe story to be the well, cars it is. Anyway, Douglas is way down there in terms of uh, sites discovered versus sites secured. This is what I was talking about. We want to work with each of these counties uh, that actually have ownership stake in these sites to close these things down. So again, this is what you're looking at out in the field. You see a hard closure. Uh, that's what I'm talking about there is you're working with steel, you're working with welding, we've got cement footings. Uh, we just completed a uh, 
the biggest back group in North America up in Virginia City. This uh, the Foreman Shack. Previously, a 2,000-foot hole. Uh, used to have a structure problem to burn down, but now all you're left with is the footings in a big old hole that you can drag many, many cars into, track and trail, whatever. So we sealed it up with this cupola. Uh, we put up a sign. Uh, you can easily get to it as a desk you know, if you're up in the area. Uh, it drives up your truck route. It's about four miles uh, down the truck route and it's turning to your uh, line of the uh, a lot of what we do, though, is, is the back play. We work with uh, Endow to find out that these areas have to become habitat, because a lot of them have. Uh, so the best, that's the best case scenario. It's just a backfill or a polyurethane they call the plug. So that's what you might see out there. And again, we talked about the internship programs that we use by now. Uh, we also work with uh, the Boy Scouts. They do a number of these. Uh, projects as your final Eagle Scout project. And that's a good partnership. Uh, public awareness campaign. Uh, we worked with a, an agency out of um, Oregon to uh, basically have a, an online presence uh, that is really focused on what kids are uh, consuming online. So it's going to be a targeted advertising that uh, is following people that are consuming content uh, where you've got uh, people looking at uh, YouTube videos, people going to money shops. And so when you visit one of those sites, uh, our software, our targeted advertisements will pop up on your phone. And I hope it does uh, because they're really, really funny. I can't show it right now, it's still in the editing phase, but this is, we're trying to reach out to a lot of different people uh, and hopefully we're doing that. So uh, please, uh, at the end of this, you want to take coffee cup or a magnet or a sticker and a bunch back there at the table. So again, I mean, this is just kind of what we share with the kids, uh, what we kind of have on our books there so people understand it's not just you're looking at a mind shaft or an attic, you're actually looking at a, a whole complex of hazards. Um, and one thing is, if you are going to go and just be aware of this, uh, there's organic material in mines. There's old timbers. There's, you know, the kind of thing where you can develop, and it's not because of the ground. It's not because of geothermal activity. You can develop uh, bad air, and that happens real easily. So we're not we're not breathing pure oxygen, but you can get into a situation if you go underground where you're breathing uh, a mixture of air that's pretty much that's fixing you, uh, and that can happen to you. Be in a coma, I mean, four steps after you walk in. I don't want to terrify anybody, but you're not going to really smell that. It's just going to happen and you're going to be out cold. So that's a, that's a hazard that you say. One of the other ones you're probably all familiar with are uh, rattlesnakes. I, well, I don't like snakes, and with my job, I'm running to them all the time. And uh, I got to say, uh, I've been in a position where I could have been. And I didn't get that, so my, my opinion is changing over the years. But you got bats, you got rattlesnakes. We had a player uh, send me a video of a, a mountain lion that was at least 200 pounds. I mean, it's a beast. Uh, so these are also areas where you could run into, you know, toxic dust, uh, hunt virus. Anybody ever heard of that? That's going to be a thing in the of mines where there's, you know, rat, mouse. Another uh, one we encounter less and less, uh, probably because people go in to hit this stuff, is explosives, blasts and caps, old dynamite. Um, you know, I heard a story from a, a guy in uh, Tonopah as part of the bomb squad, uh, Ed's mine, um, about uh, an old box that uh, he witnessed detonate, and no one was touching it. No one was messing with it. It had been, I don't know, jostled or moved, but this thing went off with no one even kind of disturbing it. So that's how fragile these things are. Blasting caps, a little less so. They can go off and just step on them. And of course, that can be hidden in the dust inside your mind. And then, like we talked about a minute ago, the following hazards. There's been, I want to say, maybe a third of the fatalities have been a vehicle going down the road where there was 
is a blind fall. Uh, we get a lot of dirt bikers falling down these. We had about five or six fatalities in the last 40 years where it was an off or it was a bike. Uh, so you do have areas, even in the pine nuts, you know, where you're going up a hill or you're coming around a corner that it has it right in the middle of the road. Uh, so um, that's something to look out for. It's something to think about when you're, you're know, ripping up and down a hill. Uh, I did bring a video uh, showing a uh, group of Marines. Uh, I don't know how much how many of your time. Yeah, for a little bit ahead of schedule. Oh, okay. Uh, are we going to move for a family video? Yeah. <laughs> series of shots where they're doing the dumbest things I can imagine. And the last thing that you see is they tie off an old rope that they found to a pipe down in the mine. I mean, they've been down there for, but we cut the videos like short, but they, they had an hour and a half of video. And they tie this rope off, and they're like, well, who has the most experienced climbing? A uh, guy raises his hand, gets on that rope, and it snaps like that. And they all start freaking out. These guys have had training, all this stuff. And the guy fell 40 feet straight down, landed on his back. Uh, and the only light they had at this point was the light that was on the VHS camera. All right? So they're freaking out. And that's where the video ends for us. But uh, they sent one of the, you know, the guy that wasn't most winded, sent him out to like two and a half hours to get out of the mine. And then they called for help. There's, there's Maybe four uh, rapid rescue teams there in the state. Washington has a really good one. But uh, down in uh, Tonopah fire, they had to get one of the things. So five hours later, and after the rescue crew itself gets lost, they get this guy out. Luckily, nobody died. He sustained a uh, broken arm. That's it. But I can tell you there's been a lot more fatalities since then than we had it on that video. But it's a real deal. Um, you don't want to end up down in the room these things get disoriented. And then I can't imagine the terror uh, that, that those guys went through, even trade marines. So we'll just move on with this. Again, incident of a bad air killing somebody all throughout, you know, 
if you're in a bag, you're going to have to lose the calories. Uh, here's a shot of the hasty tea. Um, and I think this is our uh, Mason Valley tea. But if you do encounter a um, situation where your UTV goes down one of these things uh, and you manage to scramble out, make sure you're contacting law enforcement. I see law enforcement here today. Make sure you're calling 911. Your dispatch is going to get sent to the, locus, the, the closest city, uh, hazy team, and they're going to make the assessment on the right gear, the right ropes, all that stuff. I know a lot of us have that background probably, but it's you got to leave it to them. These teams are trained for this. All right, so I do have an ask uh, coming here today. You guys are out there. There's only 15 of us for the whole state. If you do see abandoned mines uh, in your travels and you know, your gatherings, I would ask that you send me an email with a photograph and your coordinates. You don't have to. This is our standard form that we ask claimants to fill out. But a photograph and some coordinates, and that's all I need. Uh, and then we'll do the rest. But that is huge for us, especially if you guys are running into it. I mean, others are going to it close to safety. Hunter, every year we get a call from a hunter who wants a dog on a shack. At least maybe we could save, you know, a dog. But uh, that's my ask. If you do see that, please, uh, before you guys leave, grab a card. Um, I can make any other great here. But, yeah, thank you. So, uh, with that, uh, that's all I have to say. Um, here's my email, here's my phone number. Um, any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. So we're already uh, a little bit early, which is nice for a change. You do these things tend to go the exact opposite. So let's go ahead and take a 15 minutes break and come on back in. We'll hear from uh, Laura Fred Lightly. And followed by Alexis from the Off Road Business Association. Matthew, can we talk about the Facebook live feed will still be on, so you'll oh, be yeah. sharing. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, we're live streaming <laughs> on our Facebook page, so uh, if you want to say anything that uh, you can be embarrassed about, I encourage you to go to the law. Yeah, <laughs> don't say it here. <laughs>
That is, it's all map and compass. Absolutely no technology allowed. So, fast forward through my virtual bell rally, and uh, I go to the Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame convention with my husband. We're going to celebrate the very first Vora owner getting inducted into the Hall of Fame, who actually just passed away this last week, Ed Robinson. But Ed was being honored, and I wanted to make some retro Vora t-shirts. BJ and my husband and I had been longtime volunteers and participated in a little bit of the off-road races with Vora. And we asked the current owner at the time, who was Dave Cole, if we could use the logo to make some retro t-shirts. And all of a sudden, we inherited a whole racing organization. So the last almost five years, I've been uh, own, owning and operating alongside my husband, uh, Valley Off-Road Race Association. We do desert races and short course races throughout northern Nevada and California primarily. Which leads me into Tread Lightly. I had no idea what Tread Lightly was up until recently. Um, just in the last two or three years, I kind of stumbled across it and that one with the Nevada Off-Road Association has been a big eye-opener for me in kind of the back end of how things work with land access and the government just got to the point where I really wanted to help make things better. Really, I wanted to be able to help the public understand and kind of not demonize the people that work for the government quite so much, kind of bridge that gap, and Tread Lightly has given me a great opportunity to do that. So what Tread Lightly is, we're a nonprofit organization that uh, promotes respect, responsible recreation through stewardship, education, and communication. And that means that we go to events, we do online education, we have classes, you name it, stewardship projects, whether it's with clubs, organizations, the government, we're willing to do cleanups, so anytime there's an opportunity that comes up, feel free to reach out to me. Trend Lightning was created by the Forest Service in 1985 as kind of the answer to OHV. I like to explain it that after World War II, OHV became quite the pastime with Jeeps coming on the scene. So to answer that, they created, the Forest Service created Tread Lightly. Then in 1990, we became a nonprofit so that we would be able to work with all the government agencies, everything from Forest Service to BLM to state parks, all the way around. This is kind of our main principles. Our trend principles are the main education tool that we use for the public. So there's a lot of different ways to teach it. We do kids programs and everything up through adults. But travel responsibly, respect the rights of others, educate yourself, avoid sensitive areas, and do your part. We are big fans of trying to get that message out online these days, trying to get visibility out there and reach people on a bigger level than what people have seen before. Because like myself, I had never even heard of Tread Lightly before. So if I haven't heard of it, I figure there's a whole lot of other people that haven't either. So I'm all about trying to find ways to get that message out there better. One of the main things that we offer, um, we have free posters. I believe there's one actually sitting over at the BLM table back there. But we have a free poster program that's funded within the state. And you can go to the website. I have it listed there, but if you want me to send it to you, just let me know. You can order posters, and they can be customized for whatever you want. It can be off-road, it can be hiking, biking, you name it. Oh, there we go, Kim is going to actually. Yes, we have a light over here, thank you. <laughs> so you can customize your posters, and like the government agencies, you guys can get, I think, up to 50 of them. And so far, Nevada hasn't hardly ordered any. So if you know places that could benefit from posters, that I will happily hook you up with them. Nevada, we all already heard a lot about it, and I knew it was kind of going to get repeated a few times, but we've got a lot of federally managed land in Nevada. 
the only state that has more is Alaska. So just to put that in perspective, we are unique with the amount of off-road opportunities that we have. And I think with Nevadans, I mean, I'm, I'm from Nevada, and I'm guessing there's a fair amount of people here that are as well. We are very much that battle-born state of not liking being told what to do, especially when it comes to you know rules and regulations. So I feel like a big key component for Nevada is going to be that education and sort of bringing things around in a more social, approachable way rather than the hard set rules. So that's kind of where I'd like to see things go, I think, more and more, is just really working towards stewardship projects that can be highlighting the really cool areas of Nevada that your typical off-roaders may not appreciate as much as they should. And along with that, education opportunities. I'm really enjoying these days kind of blending the racing aspect of my life with the tread lightly. I've never seen racers come to stewardship projects before and replant native plants that you know, have kind of died off because of overuse. And to see those kind of things be possible is pretty cool. So I'm really, I'm feeling good about the possibility of there being, you know, more to people than meets the eye and really working on those relationships. In addition to that, my funding with the BLM and the Nevada OHV Commission has allowed for signage. I am trying to work with all agencies on kind of unification of all of the signs throughout the state, whether it's BLM, Forest Service, state parks. So throughout the year, I'll be meeting with different government agencies, and hopefully we can get together on some of it and make some decisions. This is just a picture of a sign. It was the first one. I've only been in my position since May, so this is the first sign I've been able to see all the way through so far. I've got a few others that are sort of still in the draft process with edits. But this is a really cool sign that's going to be put up at the Pine Grove Cemetery. We uh, helped Navora and a few other groups, the Nevada OHV Commission as well, um, put a fence, a bucket rail fence around the area to keep people from driving over the graves. And this is going to be a great educational tool so people don't think we're just closing things off for the heck of it. Because of course, that was the first response we got from some of our own people. So just keeping that in mind for them. Here's a highlight of a few of the projects that I've been a part of since May when I started. I was able to help out with a trail ride and a cleanup project in the Virginia City area with Ladies Off-Road Network, another group that is nationwide and very large and I've been a part of for a few years. It was really cool to connect the dogs with that. Um, the lady that runs Ladies Off-Road Network, Charlene Bauer, she is actually on the board of directors for Tread Lightly. And this upcoming year at the Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame, she will be doing like the live interviews, and that's going to be sponsored by Tread Lightly. So that should be a really cool thing you can tune into online. The Wilson Canyon Project was one of the more recent ones we did. That's like I was saying, it was really cool to have racers out replanting native vegetation. We did a project uh, for National Public Lands Day with Walker Basin Conservancy on that. And it's really cool because where I grew up is just a couple miles from there. On the other side of Wilson Canyon is where my parents still live. So this is very much my backyard and I like being able to help out. Carson Hot Springs is one that we're working on with the Forest Service. And we've been trying to take a look at what some of the major problems are in that area, why the trails are closed, can they be reopened. Um, I know they've had some problems with law enforcement out there and some illegal shooting. So luckily through Tread Lightly, I'm also able to access grant funding to be able to work on recreational shooting as well. So that may be something that we're moving towards in the future, hopefully. At the Last Vora race, the Urington 300, it happened to fall on National Public Lands Day. And I thought, how cool is it that we are having an 
off-road race on public land on National Public Land Day. We've got to do something to celebrate that. So we put together a cleanup, tread lightly, and we're teamed up to bring in a big dumpster. And all day long, people cleaned up trash like you wouldn't believe, tires and all kinds of crazy stuff. I had so much trash that people brought in from all throughout the race course. I don't even know where some of the spectators were at, but there was a lot of trash that was collected. So that was really great to see. Another example of where the off-road community would typically even think to help out, would probably kind of resist some of those ideas, but now they're actually able to participate and that relationship is getting better. Lastly is the Pine Grove project that I was just talking about where we put the fence around the cemetery. This is also an area that I frequented a lot as a child. So I was really happy to see that it's being protected. Just after we put up the fence, I was contacted by another local Harrington resident who I grew up with. His dad was the fire chief for a while, and his mom worked for the post office, and they had just spread his grandpa's ashes up there. So he wanted to thank me for making this possible, because otherwise that whole area is just going to continue to get run down, and obviously it's still being used for a place where people are having ashes spread and whatnot. So it was nice to be able to share that with the rest of the volunteers of our group. It was pretty heartwarming, I think, for everyone. And that's also a racer as well, so pretty cool there. That kind of came full circle. I've attended a whole lot of meetings down there uh, where it says Las Vegas. I've been to meetings all over the state, probably maybe four different meetings in the Las Vegas area with the Dunes and Trails Club and Vegas Valley Four Wheelers and some other groups like that. I've really enjoyed attending meetings. So if you belong to a group or an organization, and you're interested in having me come, please let me know. I'm more than welcome, or more than happy to uh, attend events and, and bring swag and talk to people about Fred Lightly. Through Fred Lightly, we've got tons of partners, so I just wanted to kind of highlight that real quick. We've got partners that are obviously with the federal government, Forest Service and BLM being two of the big ones. That's part of our funding. But then we're also able to make other really cool things happen through some of our private partners. And this is by no means all of them, it's just a few. But these are some of the ones that I feel are more relevant in our area here in Nevada. They are making it possible for me to go to Las Vegas and do a cleanup event here at the end of the month. And we were able to support another off-road event called Hump and Bump. Where's Kevin? Oh, there's Kevin. Hump and Bump is Kevin's event. And he came all the way here from Vegas. So we're really excited to be able to support that as well. And yeah, I, I really like to also utilize these partners to update some of the imagery associated with our area. New, new photos, new videos, kind of that online presence to bring awareness and along with that, I would also like to be able to really focus in on different areas of Nevada for stewardship projects. So mainly, I just wanted to throw it out there that if you know of an area that needs attention or some place that's really cool and you want to highlight, please reach out to me. I'm, I'm here the next three days. I've got business cards here, but I'm also you know, pretty easy to find online. But we have OEG areas that we've been working on with Navora in Tonopah, Mineral County, and Urington is probably the newest one. We just had the Urington City Council vote on 942 acres that they're designating as an off-road area for OEG use specifically. So I'm really looking forward to kind of expanding on that and growing and developing it utilizing it for some education opportunities with the Nevada Outdoor School. And anything else that you know comes our way, I would really like to be able to partner with as many of you as possible to kind of expand on what we've got going here. Do so you have any questions? OK, that's it.
One of the things that uh, Laura has been somewhat bashful uh, in, in saying is that she has come on board with us here at the State Association um, on par. Uh, Kim and I are obviously the, the entitled individuals, uh, but we've reached out and have volunteers to help us out. Uh, and Laura is fortunate enough to have a, a common um, path. So that's just one of those nice things that works out. Uh, and that's something that we, we're going to talk about briefly here uh, during the, ne the next segment, the segment after that. Uh, currently, uh, we're going to bring up Alexis Nelson from the Alpha Business Association. Alexis is uh, single-handedly responsible for roping me into all this off-road activism. Uh, she literally is um, probably my, my oldest Nevada-based OAP friend. Uh, so she did this to me. It's all her fault. <laughs> so, uh, like I said at the very beginning, I, I wear many hats because I have no hair, I don't have any summer. So the, uh, so one of the other ones that I do is I am the uh, national director of a group called One Voice for Motorized right Off-Road Recreation. Uh, that is an industry-sponsored group from SEMA, the folks that do the uh, big auto show down there uh, next month. Uh, and what we do at One Voice is specifically work with the uh, the, the, the level of um, clubs and associations around the nation, uh, whether it's snowmobile, off-road, uh, you know, quad ATVs, what have you, but the whole idea is that if Arthur is from Kansas and he's having a problem dealing with one particular type of off-road uh, entity, whether it's maybe it's a wildlife thing, a land use thing, maybe an equipment thing, We've got people from all over the nation that are participating in it at the same time. And it affords Arthur the opportunity to have a clean set of eyes look at his problem and possibly get it taken care of. It's almost like they're partners. Weird. I'm seeing a pattern come out. Uh, but so, uh, Alexis basically talked me into taking on that position about five, six years ago. Um, and that, uh, that led us here indirectly. So, uh, they're setting up to get ready to go. And we'll, we'll go that. Um, last thing real quick, um, there's a very important thing we have, everybody has to have a goal at the end of the day that we look forward to. Uh, we are uh, running a no-host social, which means that because we have a couple of here and buy your cocktails, uh, all the way across the casino floor at the end of the day here in the cabaret bar. Good news is that there's nobody performing tonight on stage, so if anybody wants to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, but yeah, so we're near over there uh, for some... Uh, uh, kind of off the record ish, you know, why do I want to come back tomorrow type questions uh, in that kind of a, uh, opportunity to, to do that. So, uh, how are we doing? Okay. Keep talking. Yeah. I can do it on a juggle. Do you want to learn that juggle real quick? Is something heavy or something sharp? <laughs>
New York, have used that as their uh, base data. So anyway, I, um, I moved here to Nevada about five years ago. My husband worked for Casbor, uh, they sell the green equipment, his employees. And so um, we moved here because Casbor's headquarters is in, in Reno. And I had this opportunity to work with the Opera Business Association. And so I've been working with them ever since. I've been involved for about seven years now with Orba. And it's, it's been really, it's been an amazing experience because Orba is, the, their level of operation is very professional and that's what I love. And so Orba, So what is it? So the Offshore Business Association is a nonprofit, the C6. So it's a trade-based organization where it's comprised of basically industry businesses that are for it's either OEMs, it could be aftermarket, um, it could be dealers, uh, and there's also associations that are part of Orba. Orba was established in 2001 for the purpose of representing industry. So. Basically, our whole mission is if we don't have trails to recreate it on, there's not going to be steps. So all industry got together and decided, hey, we need an organization that can represent us, that can lobby, that can shape policy. And so that's what Orba's done for the last 20 years. So one of the biggest projects that Orba's done is Save Johnson Valley. And so I think it was back in 2015, it wasn't just Orba, and this is the whole point of my presentation, is because of the amazing partnerships that Orba has with symmetrical and asymmetrical organizations, entities, and governmental agencies, plus policymakers. And so Orba's committed to preserving access and also preserving future access to trail and riding areas. And lastly, or it's also about connecting businesses to grassroots. So why partnerships? Well, I mean, our objective is to connect passionate people and organizations behind a shared purpose. So what is our shared purpose? We want access. We want access to make memories. And we want access for future generations. We want to be able to take our families out. We want to be able to race. We want to be able to go camping, we want to be able to do the things that we love. And so it's really important that we form these partnerships. So whether it's working with a local dealership or it's working with a local club or you're getting involved with your local BLM office. So it's about creating that rapport and that credibility and that connection because when we are working together, we have strength in numbers, that's when we can go to our, our policy makers and say, hey, we have an impact here, and there's our favorite riding area down the road is in jeopardy. So what can we do about it? Here we go. So it's really important that, and I'm going back to Orban, I only use Orban as an example because all of the victories that we had over the years is because of the partnerships that we have. The partnerships obviously do not form overnight. It takes commitment, it takes uh, connection, and it takes building that rapport. But once you have that partnership in place, you can actually make things happen. So we've done everything from trail signing projects and kiosk projects in Elko. We've done some work up on Kingsbury Grade. Um, we've, I mean, there's just multiple projects. And we're also working with Matthew.
taken the reins, he's at the helm, and he is the chair of One Voice right now. And One Voice is a national organization that was formed by industry enthusiasts and organizations because we identified as a group a need to have an umbrella organization that represents all the facets of motorized recreation. Right now, there's really not an entity that provides that connection, and so we saw the need. We created this organization called One Voice, and it's amazing because we have organizations from Washington all the way to New Hampshire down to like Southern Four Wheel Drive. We get together every month over a one meeting Zoom call, and we talk about issues that we're having, we share best practices, and we share resources. And so it's a, it's a really good way to build that rapport, build that credibility, and also share what is happening. And we also develop meaningful connections. And um, going back to results of partnerships and the benefits of partnerships, um, driving important decisions, and of course, speaking back into the community. And it doesn't just benefit, doesn't benefit OHG. Okay, so one of the partnerships that we've developed over the last year or so is with Tread Lightly, and we've created a campaign called UTE Impact. And so a couple years ago, we had a town hall meeting with SEMA in Moab, and we were talking about what are we going to do with this incredibly fast growing contingent of UTV operators. So UTVs are, I don't know what the percentage is, but they are a very big component of motorized recreation right now. And a lot of these new UTV operators, well, they are new, um, they, haven't, so they haven't been part of the motorized community. They don't know the rules and the trail etiquette. And so we were seeing this explosion of use and the threat of access because um, the over, I don't want to use the word overuse, but um, let's just use overuse for now. Excessive um, love. What's that? <laughs> excessive love. Yeah, Lots right. of yes. love. Yes, I like that. Yes, excessive love. So we saw this and we're like, okay, what can we do as a group to address this? And so this is where UTV Impact was born. And what it is, it's a community based education campaign. It's more about awareness. And so Tread Lightly has the educational component of UTV Impact where they talk about the Tread principles. And we also have the, um, we have four main components of the education, well, of the awareness part. And that is recognizing that there are uh, several things that uh, we want to address in, in the UTV community. Sorry, I lost my time uh, So one of them is trash. And so Laura talked about it in her uh, presentation, and we created this video, which is going to work. Yeah, 
are out there. And industry right now, Matt did want me to talk about trends. Industry right now, there are a lot of grant opportunities from industry, like private grant opportunities, not just through the federal and state government. I mean, which are, there's some really good uh, grant opportunities with governmental agencies, but there's also private opportunities. And these private opportunities, they really want to see these partnerships form because there's a, there, we're going to have a greater chance of receiving adequate funding to get things done when we have these partnerships in place. private funders as well. Yamaha and Polaris are two of them um, that fund these sort of things too. They fund at Nevada Outdoor School um, to be doing exactly what we're doing here today and to get out new projects and programs and yeah. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. So Yamaha has a quarter, so they have four grant cycles per year and they fund small clubs up to associations, state associations, um, it's, I think it's the Yamaha Outdoor Initiative grant application. Yamaha is a big supporter of Orba and One Voice. We receive funding from them every year. And they're also helping us with Oceana Dunes. Um, and then Polaris has the, the Trails Grant, which I will say is getting uh, more challenging to receive money because I think it's been been established for a while now, and um, they're, they're getting pretty specific about what the club is looking, what the association is looking to accomplish. Uh, so I guess my point is it's, it's getting more challenging to obtain money through that program. But there's also um, the Fox Trail Trust Program, and they're focusing on merging both motorized and non-motorized. Uh, activities, and so that's why we were working on this project with uh, Matthew because it combines mountain biking, um, hiking, and operating. Any other questions? What's the goal mm -hmm. of turning down 180 in the SLP? Where I sign them, I apply for them, fight the 180 days. What's your end game? What's your goal? Well, I think we're pushing for 30 days. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, so uh, about five years ago, I guess, when we first moved yeah. that forward. Yeah. Um, the issue with, with the permitting is kind of like the, uh, the Recreate non red Tape Act, which is in Congress right now. Uh, it fits very well into the Nevada narrative. Uh, anybody here ever see a yellow sign on the side of the road that says open range? Do you think that's because uh, the ranchers need to know where to put their cows? No. <laughs> Because it's Nevada. Nevada is open unless specifically market closed. And that's our position as well, both to the SRP and also uh, the Red Great Non Red Tape Act, uh, which is uh, no offense, BLM. You guys can't get the permit done in 30 days, then it's approved. So, what it needs to do is it, it, it forces the land managers into a position where they actually have to have a well put together streamlined process. In defense of BLM, which is a phrase I use way too often, um, they have, uh, in order to help me the name of it, there's an online filing program. It's Raptor. Raptor, yes. Yeah, so it's an online SRP application. Which is going to make a gigantic difference uh, because just having the Raptor program there, once it's all up and fully functional, should put you in a position where you, know, you can go no further on your permit application unless you've met the prerequisites to there. You know, which is awesome because that way when your office gets them, you're not getting some pile of, of garbage. Um, the other side of it, uh, I know from uh, the congressional point of view, is there is a line in this next budget coming up um, that somehow or other addresses permits, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank, it's been a long day, uh, and that is going to be a financial uh, budgeting issue. And my understanding that's already in, in the proposed budget moving forward, uh, which is going to force the hand on some of the, the log jams on some of these things. Um, I, I don't have any more insight than that, but it must be memory. Yeah, that's, no, that's excellent. And 
Another component of streamlining, streamlining the permit process is also there's a component of the independent monitoring. And so we're looking at, we talked to putting together like a certification process for this third party to come in it, for these events. So it's not put on BLM, already taxed, like these, these guys and women, gotta go, are already taxed with, they don't have the resources and the time and the personnel. So having this certification process in place for an independent monitoring will be a big part of streamlining that permit process. Yes? Question about that. So would that be an additional fee that the promoter would have to pay, obviously, to have that independent, like during the race itself or during the event? Well, the promoter has, the permittee, let's just say the permittee, has to pay for that BLM personnel to monitor the event. So, I mean. Same government. Yes. But it needs, there needs to be a certification process in place to ensure that the third party is, they're able to do it and follow the rules. And that certification process is penciled in to be conducted by Trent Dyke. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
of the truth. I'll make that clear. It's not everything I say is. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I was the Yes, I was actually the Statewide Association um, mapping, so consistent mapping available, um, and then consistent signing, which was nice because Laura talked about that in her presentation. So all of these things are coming together. So this work, my whole point is, this work and your participation does, it does make a difference. It might not feel like it in the moment, but it definitely makes a difference. So I want you guys, your next call to action, other than check out BTV and technically spread the word, is think about a partnership that you think you could, either as an association, as a business, as an entity, that you can connect with and start working on building that, that rapport and that credibility. Thanks, everyone. All right, uh, Kim and I are going to uh, put everybody to a nice relax, just this side of snooze. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Paul, go ahead, sir. Can I just make one kind of extension of that call to action? My name is Colin Robertson. I'm the administrator of the Nevada Division of Outdoor Recreation. I'm really glad to be here with you. I think it's tremendous that there's this kind of organization of uh, people's efforts, and that's really one of the more tremendous thing that comes out of the OHB program and the commission's investment in organizations like NORA. Um, and we're really just delighted to see as much engagement as there is. One of the things that, from the state's perspective, that would be really valuable for all of you to take away with you is advocating for the resources that the BLM needs to manage land for access. So I'm not that old yet, but I was in the fourth grade when most of the resource management plans in Nevada were created. And they have not been revised, uh, with a couple of exceptions, they have not been revised since then. So getting those resources that the BLM needs to create the revision of those RMPs is what helps to protect access. So advocate with your elected officials for those resources to continue that effort and um, utilize and leverage the ORBAs and the Nevada Outdoor Business Coalitions and the Outdoor Recreation Roundtables to help do that with you. Yeah, and I agree, and it would be nice if the uh, Nevada Outdoor Business Coalition would uh, warmly embrace the Marais community. Uh, we had to guilt them into letting us be a member. Uh, so, but, I understand the rise isn't for everybody, uh, and that's fine. That's also why we need to draw a brush approach, which is I don't care why you're out there. Number one, you probably drove there in a car. You probably drove on a dirt road or a mountain mining road, which means you're already, at that point, on the road vehicle, and you're uh, recording on, on our public land. So, uh, so come on, I'm going to talk about the status of uh, the uh, OHD here in Nevada. And before we do that, Alexis and I had had a conversation earlier <laughs> and this is going to segue nicely into what we're going to get into next. The light's just killing me because it's reflecting my glasses. So I think it's probably the start of the carpet. <clears throat> so what happens is uh, there's a, a small community that's it's not very well known in the off road community it's called Moab, Utah. <laughs> <laughs> they are having problems now. They have reached a level of maturity in their off road tourism community and their off road use community where the management plans are insufficient. There have been lawsuits that have been filed by adversaries from motorized off-road. Um, and it's basically a big to-do. That's quite way to put it. What, this is purely my position, what I believe has happened is because they failed to address the possibility of growth as they move forward, that they've not found themselves in the corner and everybody's excited about uh, the possibility of closing access or uh, restricting access, uh, removing trails from inventory and what have you. Nevada is in the unique position because we are so junior in our motorized off-road recreation community uh, and uh, in our office of outdoor recreation where we need to be working together now for after I'm dead, pronounce them. And what it boils down to is that if we are not taking a positive stewardship position today, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, uh, the access isn't going to be there because our community, I know this will be a surprise to everybody here, 
our rice community does have a fairly high percentage of jackasses that we're trying to wield them in and get them to be um, less jackassy. Yes. All right. Um, Kim Garcia has been here all day. Kim is uh, the Associate Director of Government Affairs for us here at the Nevada Alford Association. And as everybody knows, because I keep saying my name, my name is Matthew Gilman. Uh, and we put this together. Kim and I, uh, oddly, uh, both have a background in the United States Coast Guard. I spent 20 years before I retired from them. And Kim did about a decade. And early random, she wound up at the Bridgeport Forest Service Office as their recreation yeah. staff officer. Thank you. Uh, I don't speak for a certain so the uh, so, yeah, uh, but we had we had a problem with looking at some uh, use issues in the Sweetwater, which is Southern Lyon and Southern Douglas County. Uh, and we met, and it's like a couple days between Christmas or something like that. December 23rd. We have an anniversary day coming up. <laughs> uh, yeah, on, on uh, the Marine Corps Observatory uh, Roma. And we talked about things, and, and then uh, came ahead with the Forest Service. Uh, for some family for some family issues, and we brought her on board. So it was a server divinity moment where she was available to bring a wealth of knowledge that I just don't have uh, to the land use side, because uh, I'm always on the outside of the hand, and she's good on the inside. The sticky side of the red tape, right? Yeah, the sticky, <laughs> side, the sticky side of the red tape. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so we got a little bit of PowerPoint stuff. I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to be very brief for change. Um, we talk a little bit about some of the numbers, some of the staff, some of the things we have going on, and then we're going to turn it over to Janet. Uh, uh, she's going to uh, run the show. Uh, before you guys leave today, guys and girls, I'd like to take an opportunity to come over here and take a look at this map. Kind of cool map. It's not complete. It is my best, but I ran out of time. These are just some of the hundred or so plus projects that we're tracking, working on, or otherwise having direct input in. The Met Offered Association has been funded for 10 months, 12 days. Uh, we, we formed up uh, through some donations and stuff last year, uh, became a 501c3. Uh, we have touched, probably a good way to put it, uh, just shy of $4 million worth of projects on the ground in the state of Nevada in 10 months, 12 days. I think that's pretty cool. That is supporting people's projects, helping them run grants, uh, you name it. If anybody needed advice or if they needed us to actually do their paperwork, we hopped on it and we're, we're just this far short of $4 million. And I think that's pretty good in 10 months. Right. So, partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Uh, Lexus said it, we've heard it a couple times, we've heard it in conversations. And what it boils down to, okay, show it here. Who went to private school as a kid in this deep lab? Okay, I'm all alone. <laughs> Partnerships are important, and let's just uh, talk about it. The whole idea, and Colin did as well, the whole idea of making sure that we are leveraging ourselves to put ourselves in a position to solve this problem. We're understaffed when we have no money. There's not a single federal office that I have talked to that in one way or another, there are some offices that are prohibited from using this phrase, so they tap cancer revenue. But this is what they're saying. They don't have the staff, they don't have the resources, they don't have the money. The lack of capacity. Lack of capacity, another way to put it. The uh, fun thing about that is that through partnerships, and when you, do, when you start to build that trust, when you've done your 26 hours of multi-engine time, and you realize that this guy's not going to kill you, that's when you realize that our community, the private side, the NGO side, the club side, we actually are in a position to augment and be a force multiplier for park service, for BLM, for reclamation, uh, uh, for service, you name it. And that's what it's all about. We're not asking to get paid by you guys, you guys being the federal government. Uh, we're not asking for any kind of that. We want to make our public lands better that we hire those agencies to manage. These numbers are not 100% up to date. Uh, Nikhil, let me know some of the new ones were out like yesterday. I went, yeah, that was good enough. So um, these are the breakdowns uh, of OHU registration. This one over here, the uh, all train vehicle and side by side, the 19,000 and 20,000 rigs separately, 
I honestly believe that never came correct. I'm going to just empirically or not empirically, uh, <laughs> I'm going to guess. I'm going to suggest that that 19,000 number is about half that, and that those pieces of equipment specifically are just mislabeled, and they should be in the UTV side-by-side -side category, just because of what we're seeing out there in motorized wreck. Fascinating thing, there's two things that are fascinating about this for me. Um, OHD other than 129. No one knows what they are, but they, they got a sticker. That's cool. Um, but the other ones that change uh, the motorcycles. Motorcycles are 7,300 plus or minus. Motorcycles are our biggest challenge in motorized off-road recreation as far as the stewardship goes, because motorcycle riding is a unit, uh, uh, solitary sport. It's very easy to hop on your bike and go plowing through the desert, down the road, whatever, you don't need anybody else around you. So they don't see the value necessarily in um, being more social or more structured for clubs. Uh, that's, that's the mindset that I'm, we're, we're going to change. Just, it is what it is. The other thing about the motorcycles, and, and uh, we talked earlier today during the OC Commission meeting, there are certain categories of motorized off-road recreation, power sports, that are not required to be registered. Competition vehicles are one of them. So people who are motorcycle racing are not registering their vehicles, despite them practicing testing and everything else out on our public lands, which would require them to have a sticker. I don't have a solution to that either. Uh, my favorite statistic, though, is over here on this, this chart here. This actually tells you the, the percentages by county uh, of how many, uh, how many vehicles, uh, off-road vehicles are, are registered. And my favorite is Clark County. So Clark County, which makes up 73.8% of the state population, only has 32% of the registered vehicles, which is fascinating. Because you would think, just because they have three quarters, that just the numbers alone would, would bump them up above that one third. They literally have two thirds, or uh, three quarters of, of the population, and less than one third of the registered vehicles. Uh, the pedacadon, the pedacadon, that's kind of neat too, uh, because it comes out of 0 0.07, tied with Lincoln County. Uh, the ones that, that again, I, I get number weird, number nerdy. Uh, Story County. Story County per capita, 9.3% of their community has registered in OHD. I have seen the state. Humboldt County is in there too. So those are just fun numbers. Anybody wants copies of that stuff? Shoot me an email. Um, I just think it's kind of fascinating because it's possible that I was in a public meeting in maybe the largest populated county and I had a politician tell me that. Their county is the only one that registers their OHDs. No, they're not. So. I think so. There we go. I am going to sit down and give this all over to Kim. Is that talking about? Gee, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. All right. So um, we're going to hear this over and over again because we know it works, right? So stewardship, safety, education. That is our primary mission with uh, Nevada Offer Association. Right here, I'm highlighting my favorite people, some of my favorite people. Hey, that outdoor <laughs> school, right? They are totally bringing in that safety and education piece as, uh, as it's tread lightly. Um, and so working with the schools here, this is a turn of project, which was awesome. And it happened organically. A, a meeting, a partnership, an outdoor recreation community leader said, hey, I also work for the school. We have kids. Our parking lot is full of bikes and ATVs and UTVs, and they don't want helmets, and we need to, we need to start there. We need to start with the next generation. You guys are stepping up. I appreciate you. All right. So then our secondary in how do we get to our primary mission is through events, clubs, and organizations. We've talked about this, right? So the events show that the registration stickers are on the ground. Help us highlight other projects. So um, right here, the Brett G. Palmer Freedom Run. So it was a total run out of Smith Valley. And what we did is we ran the course by our existing projects through Wilson Canyon, through Pine Grove. So we are trying to make event permits include a stewardship component or an education piece. Okay? And then you can see here we have the Easter Sierra ATV UTV Jamboree. So that is our walker, but all of the events 
most of the rides are in Nevada. So that, that whole blurry um, line between jurisdictions and state lines and all that magic that we're going to have to work in partnerships to address, um, that was a great success. Um, that might be kind of my plan to fame is <laughs> California shut down all forests. Uh, HT is not a California forest. Uh, and Nino sent out a report saying everything's closed and Bridgeport is closed. So I said, excuse me, as a step officer <clears throat> in Bridgeport. And I brought uh, a ranger at the time, a great guy. He was a detailed ranger. Bridgeport's known for a plethora of detailed rangers. <laughs> in 10 years, I went through 13 rangers. It's called Ranger Grinder, that district. Um, and we challenged the community and my crews and other uh, law enforcement officers and, and uh, land managers, if we could go out and interact with the public directly in the wilderness, in the communities, at this event, to protect this event because COVID had shut down tourism. And these communities, these rural communities were at a point, at a breaking point. And they're like, if we don't have this, we're going to close we're going to close down anything. Walker, uh, if you know, had the Mountain View fire. They lost 31 homes this uh, months before this event. And so we really needed to have this event. So we challenged everyone at this event, and I think there were about 130, to please pick up trash, stay on the trail, watch dry grass, don't drive over it. You have to move over, make sure you move over. We went through every detail of the morning breakfast about how they were going to show or make or break us standing up against shutdowns for events that were properly managed, for activities that were authorized. And uh, it was a great success. And the next week, uh, I went to a couple other meetings. I love acronyms. Here's a good The YOGACT. Has anyone heard of YOGACT? <laughs> yeah, it's a bunch of words, but basically you're summoning all surrounding communities. So. <laughs> <laughs> We went to that meeting, I went to that meeting representing the HT and all the communities, all the rural communities were like, why are we not open in Bridgeport Place? And then I got to say, because we went out and we formed with the community all these different ways to get the word out that this is the last smokeless place. Let's keep it that way. Um, this is where everyone gets to go. So at the same time, the Tamarack Fire and the uh, Caldor were happening, happening, happening. And people lost homes and had no place to go. And so we opened, I opened up closed areas and campgrounds and said, you may stay beyond the 14 days. We are your safe harbor. So many people got kicked out of the Southern neighbor came to Bridgeport and we turned in Northern Morgan County into the destination at that time. So it can happen with partnerships and responsible recognition. And then Pine Grove Ghost Town uh, cleanup. This is the Pine Nut Mountain Trail Association and the Forest Service. Yeah, you see my people, I made them wear uniforms and press them, wear badges, show up and be good. Um, <laughs> this was uh, Matthew and I, our first success together, right, was we started five years ago. Our first date. Our first date. date. So, <laughs> and a great success. And part of a phased project approach, so that's another thing that we're doing, is that we started with a cleanup. Then we went to uh, fuels uh, reduction, so we cut out the sagebrush around these historic uh, sort of buildings. And then went on to the graveyard fencing. Okay, so let's talk about partnerships, right? So we created a partnership by accident uh, on the airstrip. So hey, I got some friends, and I got some friends, and we'll call our friends, and we'll hold some meeting, and poof, like what, 20 to 50 people showed up, got that partnership strong, and we developed this mission, these three mission statements, and we go over them, we post them on our agendas, and create an inclusive communicative relationship with all stakeholders in the partnership area. We could do this throughout Nevada, have different partnerships that come together like this, we can be successful. If you look at the map, notice where the Sierra Nevada Sustainable Recreation Partnership is? All those projects come out of that partnership. If you notice also on the map, um, other areas where we have projects are based because there's a club there. So it's the club and the partnership that's making these successes happen, right? Okay, so we want to introduce all stakeholders and create a network and discuss projects, areas, proposals to reach a common goal. So it's not a place for soapboxes. It's not a place for um, you know, the technicians that are just gonna help us get the groundwork done. This is leadership, senior leadership of organizations and agencies, okay? And we're gonna talk about a common goal. Stay out of those sticky places, these right? And identify and develop partnership agreements among stakeholders. So that's MOUs, that's volunteer agreements, is how we 
are authorized to work together. Okay, this is the example. So you can see here at the bottom, Walker Basin Conservancy and Nevada Offer Association put this presentation together to reach out to other partnerships that are in the area that are um, developing or trying to develop plans, whether it's recreation or conservation. What we are trying to do and change is that motorized should be recognized and invited to the table at all times. Because again, I'm going to highlight, we are all motorized recreationists and so we diversify at the trailhead. So until someone's, until someone's teleporting, we're all motorizing the thing. This is a great project. Some folks have talked about it. This is the uh, Walker Basin received a grant through the Nevada Offer uh, Grant Program, and then we implemented it, and we just got the first phase. What was a nightmare about this project was that, and it's typically where we start, who's on the first, who's on the second? And it's a kind of mapping exercise, right? And then we prove what's out there. Uh, and we had to figure out where exactly did the DLM and Forest Service and and, uh, and blah, blah, blah. Oh my goodness, it was a nightmare for, oh, how many months did we just talk about the stupid map? Yeah, there's that. Uh, but now we come to the other side. And there's additional phases to this. This is phase one. It's the right pairing, right? Then we're going to move over to the other side and work on this first camping. Then we, if you look across from Wilson Canyon, you'll see the Forest Service side and it's not motorized because there are some very high value, prehistoric goodies out there. And we don't want to drive them over. But the hill climb, for those who see the rest stop, there's a, and once you see a trail, right? Someone else is going to do it, someone else is going to do it, and you see all these burned trails, user created trails that are not motorized area. So how do we avoid that? So that's what this planning group does. We're like, we're staging an area somewhere else further down the road. And that's what we're going to be doing. All right, that's, we am going to teach about that later, but if you have questions, please ask us. Pine Mountain Trails Association has been um, just spearheading a bunch of this great stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Guy. <laughs> so this is the fence project that we were talking about. And again, we just finished this last weekend. And so the first phase, of course, was the, um, the cleanup, then was the fuel reduction, and then the fencing, which will add more fuel reduction, so we have parking, and it's going to keep going. We have tons of ideas that are coming out uh, to protect Pine Grove. And Matthew, is that correct? Is that the like most visited ghost town yeah, in Nevada? Yeah. That's, that, that's an uninhabited ghost town. Okay. So that's the all I have. I have a really cool slide where I was going to show all of our partners and all of our projects, and it's going to be like the spaghetti in the middle, how we're connecting everybody. Matt's kind of doing that, but technology and I are not doing too well at 2 a.m. last night, so there's that. We're still not doing too, doing too well today, but we're trying. So again, we're going to keep highlighting partnerships. We're going to keep highlighting stewardship. We'd like to develop larger um, partnerships across the state. Um, we're not trying to draw lines. We started off thinking, well, the tours of the regions might be good. Um, I think it's going to develop naturally because um, some communities naturally work together. Um, I'm just going to focus on this here in Nevada right now. Uh, so, Uriton, Hawthorne, and Bridgeport, you know, Bridgeport's in California, they all need their own experience and highlight that in the sweet waters. So, it's, it's those communities that serve each other. And so, we're looking for partnerships surrounded by clubs, um, surrounded by a club, and the area that they serve. So um, working on developing clubs is really, really, really the first step. And how many clubs we had around? I just found out that we uh, had one that just came to the age out of the way of So uh -oh. uh, they were around seven or eight. Okay, and we have how many in development that were encouraging? Uh, okay, so this year, uh, um, one of the things that we're doing, we're going to be forming a club. Nikhil, uh, for those of you who are here this morning, Identified Club as, as an organization that actually pays dues uh, from the members. Uh, one of the things that we use frequently is that nobody's ever washed a medical car, which incidentally isn't true because I have because we can't even all throw a bank on the no, but the, the, the no ownership rule still applies. Um, so where we are failing in off-road is that the the use, uh, or, or sorry, the collective, the, the groups are social media focused, primarily Facebook. Um, I'm presumably Instagram, but I'm too old for Instagram, and I still care. Uh, but that being said, the, 
the, the traditional club is where a lot of the values that the light lady and that outdoor school, uh, that outdoor association are working to get out. The traditional clubs are where that came from. Um, in my the bio and thing, it noted that I am originally a strong New York from Central New York State. I can remember to this day Alan Nasser chewing me out because I got my strong wheel stuck as a teenager for two weeks on the stupid. And Alan Nasser, who by the way is still alive, he's in the late 90s, um, is probably the last guy to give any advice. Uh, but those those interactions, that mentorship, that handing down, passing the mantle to the younger generations, um, that's missing because now it's just a matter of, look, Facebook group. We can all go Facebook stuff together. Uh, so one of the, the charges that we've taken on is also to develop the, what I call the brick and mortar clubs, and I got that from uh, Larry. Uh, <laughs> and, and actually have that. I would go one step further than the clear definition of uh, paying dues. I want to see officers. I want to see the president of the club. You don't necessarily have to be go nonprofit or be incorporated or whatever, but there needs to be some buy-in from your memberships. And that's oh, where an outreach coordinator. That's, right. Yeah. That's, outreach coordinator that, that's how I started outreach coordinator for the Pine Nest Club. Um, so we were successful in the last uh, two years. Uh, the Big Horn Out Back Explorers Club, I'm big into that, uh, led by uh, uh, Carl Olson. Although he's not the president, but believe me, it's led by Carl. Uh, and I love Carl. I've known Carl for a number of years. He is literally the biggest man in North America. The uh, the other club that we were successful in starting is the Elko OHD Club, uh, Elko County OHD Club, obviously out of Elko. And we had one that I think we're going to go roll out in the spring, uh, which is Battleborn Offerers. That will be the first one we actually take away from social media and make them into a legitimate brick and mortar club. Um, that one is important to me for a lot of reasons. They already have a, a significant following online, but they are all inclusive. Uh, if you want to be driving a Jeep, you want to be driving a, a Ranger pickup truck, you want to be riding a motorcycle, they're not concerned. Their concern is that you have positive stewardship values while you're out there on our public lands and on our crest. Um, and I expect that to, to I'm sorry, I expect that to run through uh, their cycle scene here in Jordan. Some of you know Jordan. Um, he's going to be working with that group, and, and we're going to try and tie it to their. Uh, spring high come by your your car sports and bus thing in the spring. So you mentioned mentorship is important in the brick and mortar club, if that's what we're going to call them now. Um, but I think there's also a Facebook group um, might say, oh, we have this many followers and we feel this way. That doesn't hold water, right? What we need is a club and these are our constituents. This is how many people, members we have, we're paying dues, we're active, this is our, our proof of our talking on Facebook is great, it starts the conversation, but it doesn't hold water when we go to the line managers and we discuss alternatives and options and, and more with the planning. Yeah, along with those lines, I'll give you in just a sec. Along with those lines, the, the uh, response to, or the tactic I take rather in dealing with some of these, com uh, these uh, collections of people who are looking maybe to join a club, is that if I were a Facebook group and I have 10,000 likes, uh, Congressman Amade does not care. If I run a club and I have 150 members and we meet once a month, I bet you I can get Congressman Amade to come speak to it. And that's the difference. Um, so when we go to advance uh, and support a bill, for example, that's going to give Arthur a pay raise, it makes a difference if it's a club. You can't say Arthur deserves a pay raise because the Acme Off-Road Super Fun Club on Facebook said so. It's not going to go anywhere, which means you're not getting pay raise. <laughs> it, see, zero one, you're sitting up close. You're, you're my go-to. <laughs> I think that's about it. Did we cover it? It, it is. Um, I'm going to wrap everything up here. A couple things, just a little bit more housekeeping. Um, tomorrow we are doing a ride uh, that BLM put a uh, track together 30-ish miles. Um, if you have not filled out that form that indicates whether you have a vehicle that you want to take on there and or have uh, a seat available, we're going to try and figure that out. I do not know if we're going to have enough seats for everybody that wants to participate. So if you are on the fence and you're like, eh, and, and you don't care to go or not, if we do run tight, uh, we're going to be asking for volunteers first to step back and say, I don't want to go. Uh, and then what we may wind up doing is literally a lottery of, you know, however many of the guys that we need. 
So this brings today almost to a close, but as uh, for those of you that are stickers for details and have read your agenda, so there's a quiz. <laughs> See who's paying attention. First person to correctly answer. Oh, I'm sorry, I take that back. Larry, you want to say something? Well, I was talking, uh, thinking about the brick and mortar clubs versus the online clubs. The brick and mortar clubs uh, tend to have a peer pressure uh, within them. When they take on a project or they say they're going to do something, it usually gets done because of the interior peer pressure in the club, whereas uh, people that are just names out there in cyberspace, uh, they have no peer pressure. That's an amazing observation that I hadn't put into that context, but you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Awesome. All right, uh, before the quiz, uh, Novo Social Honor over in the Cabaret Bar, which if you get onto the casino floor, one stop up, walk diagonally all the way past everybody that's playing slot machines. Uh, you'll see some tables out there and there's a cocktail lunch, and I will be up there once we're straight away. So here's the quiz. So what I do for these is I immediately go out to uh, the public lines and steal their signs. Uh, <laughs> because I figure they're all there. They're never going to figure it out. <laughs> Draw hands, first person to pick up the correct answer. What year was Tread Light the Yeah. Which Tread Light? Who knows? Oh, where's Tread Light? 1970. Paul, can you say, Dion, please read the sign out loud. Caution, Bigfoot area, stay on Mark Trails. Please place all human remains. In the black garbage bag provided for this purpose. Thank you for your cooperation. We'll see everybody here in the morning or over at the uh, Doctor Lodge. Thank you so much for coming out. It was a world day. Thank you.
No, I was also like that double. Oh, no, I know, but you can do oh, that. Yeah, that yeah. Oh, that's easy. Yeah. Okay, then I can let Arthur go. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. I was sharing that How do you end this and make sure we save it so that. Okay, so when you go to end my videos. Ah, I need to slap off. You go to end my videos and you hit.